Whoa. This has changed a lot since the last time I was in here. Yeah, we've been, uh, we've been moving some things around. So we're here at one of my favorite places when I'm home at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. Got two of the best guys you could ask for to hang out at the museum with, with Doug Bowles and Jason Van Sickle. Jason probably has forgot more about what's going on at the Speedway and the museum than I will ever learn. And Doug is just everything. I mean, everything that's inside these walls and everything around this facility, Doug knows all the details about it. So you couldn't ask for two better guys to walk around, reminisce, tell stories, learn a lot. It's a great day to hang out with these two at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum. So I can't even imagine back in the day when they used these garages and wiring hanging from the underside of the eaves and everything. I mean, it's completely different than probably what you were used to in the new concrete garages. Um, the, the initial garages were built here in 1914, but these wooden garages really lasted up until 1986. And I remember hearing from some of the old guys about how you know, May could, May could be really hot and May could be really cold and you could get snow flurries still at times. And I remember hearing some of the guys talk about they would take 55 gallon drums of methanol and methanol doesn't flash. And they would cut the top off of it and light the top of it to, to heat the garage. And was this the correct width of the garage? Yeah, they got a little tight. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've seen photos, especially when you have like these uh, these late early 70 cars, wide cars, wide tires. They have to stack the tires up on the outside and then uh, wheel the car on with go jacks and things like that. Uh, but they got pretty tight in the later later portions. If you get a chance to find these doors, they're still around. So all the doors when they tore them down, so there are people that collect those doors mm -hmm. now. In fact, I get calls off if somebody says, "Hey, I want to find one of the old garage doors." There's so much history in these doors, and it's pretty cool to have these replicated here the way it is. And the, and the garages that you used when you first ran in, in IndyCar, and then again when Cup was coming, those A, B, and C garages inside, it's the same location. And that's why IndyCar hasn't moved to the garages that NASCAR uses when they're here, because they just love that connection to our yeah. history and to be in the location where garages have always been. But what's, what's crazy about Rick is that's where it started, right? And so to start in that and yeah. then become one of the most successful oval IndyCar, oh, IndyCar driver, but certainly oval IndyCar drivers of all time, and that's his training ground. It just to me is Jimmy Johnson, same way. You, yeah, exactly. Another to sit there and point. see what they did on smooth paved ovals. Love it. Things we wanted to do with this exhibit, 82, even though it wasn't a uh, a win for Mears, um, we wanted to recreate the the 82 finish with John Cock and, and Mears. Was here. Was, so was that the was that the margin of victory? Well, I'm not a it was closer person. than that, I think. Yeah the late 90s, and the, well I mean I came into IndyCar in the late 90s and there were a lot of changes when IRL started versus what CART and IndyCar had before that. IndyCar had its struggles, NASCAR had its struggles then and it really pretty much all of motorsports started putting a focus on we need to start looking at the safety aspect and the great thing is once one aspect of motorsports does something, especially in that category you, everybody has to follow suit because then you can't be labeled a well, they didn't care about it. But it was the best thing that could have happened for a lot of us was having that opportunity to, to have all these advancements in safety, getting to composite tubs and chassis. That, that was a game changer for, for this industry. How are you? Sorry to interrupt. You. <laughs> My name is Pedro. I came from Portugal. You came from yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Nice you. you too. Thank you for coming. So I didn't get to spend much time with Al, but the knew I had a helmet collection. He asked if I had all the Indy 500 winners. I said, no, not yet. I, I don't have a Mears helmet. I don't have an Al Senior helmet. So literally, I am in California getting ready to go to the track at Fontana uh, after I'd retired. And the phone rings, and I look at it, and it's an Albuquerque number. And I didn't answer it because I thought it was a telemarketer. Didn't recognize the number, so I didn't answer it. Finally. The next morning on Saturday morning it rang again. I'm like, telemarketers don't call on Saturdays. I'm like, you better answer this. Put the phone in my head. Tony, this is our answer. And I about dropped the phone. And I just, and at that moment I'm like, I didn't answer the phone twice the day before that was Al Unzer. I had a pro, I bet I had a 45 minute conversation with him and the best thing out of it, which he knew I had the helmet collection. And uh, he sent me a helmet. That, that was one of his that he had and uh, probably one of the coolest things. And in the meantime, I had actually got an owl, an owl helmet from uh, 1970 that was signed. Wow. 
but then this was one that he sent me. It had a knob on it, had the speakers in there, in the helmet, and you could dial the volume up on the right side, which yeah. I thought was odd because it's probably going to be leaning up against something. But to get that helmet from Al, and he sent me a sheet that gave a little bit of the story of the helmet, that's one of the coolest things that, uh, and that's literally, the only, that was the only time I ever talked to Al Sr. that I can remember, maybe at the track when I started in 96, but to have an uninterrupted call with Al Unser Sr. Yep. was something that I'll, I'll never forget that moment. Uh, you know, with the Unser family in good uh, hands. What is, what is that back there? The, bump, the noise, it's a garage door. The building's pressurized and the garage door on certain days starts beating. <laughs> I remember in 99 when I ran the double, I remember coming and nobody stayed, nobody was allowed to stay inside the racetrack at night. Yeah. And I remember Tony letting me stay in the infield and in, in the bus lot now beside the garages. And I got back about one o'clock in the morning from running in Charlotte, and I'm, I'm not joking. It was alive, the whole place was alive. And I've told this story to people and they look at you like, come on, man. And the amount of noise that was inside that place and what sound, the activity that you could hear, it was like, it was like the movie Field of Dreams. It was like, as soon as it got dark and nobody was around, everybody came out and did what they do every night. Yep. And you could hear it. It's funny, I, I've never been a big believer in that. I've been here 13 years, and you hear stories from people who worked here forever, just the things that feel that way. I'm and, telling and if you. If you walk around this place at night when nobody's here, back of the grandstands, along the front stretch, it's alive. You know, you see all these TV shows and paranormal activity right. and this and that, and I don't believe it. I don't believe any of that stuff. But I am telling you, that night, there was so much stuff going on, and you're looking around going, you're gonna see somebody at some point, yep. or groups of people. It was that loud, and it's like, there's nothing moving. There's, you can't, you physically could not see anything, but you closed your eyes, and you could hear everything. Well, here's a car that you're familiar with. So when we came originally, when we got ready to do AJ's tribute, the year here at the Speedway, they wanted me to drive the 64 car. So the 61 car was sitting next to it. And they said, well, Anthony's gonna drive this car. So I got in, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm way more comfortable in this car. I said, listen, I got seniority on Anthony. So Anthony can drive the 64 car, I'm gonna drive the 61 car. So this is, this is the car that I got to drive. Uh, and AJ that works here and maintains all these cars, I jokingly, while we were here, said, hey, you know, I need to come and do a test so I don't screw up trying to drive this thing. Pull the car out on the short shoot in between one and two and got to drive it. And then lo and behold, I'm driving the car, I come in and stop and there's AJ standing there with Robin Miller. Let me say thanks for giving us some time to hang out with you. It's always good when we get back here. You know, you love this place as much as Jason and I do, so thanks. But I got an Indy 500 coming up in 150-ish days or so. I got to get back to the office and you got a special treat. I think Jason's going to take you down to base and have Awesome, thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate everything you do for us. Uh, you do a great job here. I mean, I don't think the fans and everybody understand how much time and dedication you put to the Annapolis Motor Speedway. And uh, your boss is pretty cool. He gives you a little bit of rope to work with and let you hang out with us today, and we appreciate it. He is pretty cool, but I also want to thank you. We don't get to have a dirt track here without you. I mean, I, how many times do I call you with suggestions and help, and I appreciate you always being available to make the racing better and to make it better for our fans. So thanks so much. Have a great, uh, great trip down there with Jason. I wish I could go with you, but. Okay, hit up. All right, buddy. I appreciate your time. Thank you. You heard the boss man. I get to do all the cool special stuff. So what do you got for me? So what we'll do is we'll take you to a special place. We can't show it all, but we'll show you a little bit of the basement. Awesome. I love the basement. Great. Let's go.